Hey everybody, welcome to our vlog. <laughs> uh, for real, we're having a podcast here. We've been told it's neither. Help, Jason. <laughs> Boom. Welcome everybody, uh, Faith Bible Church, our, our podcast here, Jamie. Yeah. Thanks for uh, hanging out with Mike Arnold this last week. And hey man, it was great. We had a good time. Yeah, so. no doubt. Super pumped about today. Um, Dr. Glenn Kreider from Dallas Theological Seminary, both Jamie and, and I had him in classes. Uh, I was there on campus and you got to take him via yeah, a lot of a lot of mini masters up at DTS, and uh, Dr. Kreider was one of my favorite profs ever. So I took as many classes as I could with, with you, Dr. K. So always always loved those classes. So glad it's it's a real honor and privilege to get to sit down with you, uh, even if it's over a video call. But thanks for thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Quick question for you. I, I remember having you in class. Are you are you still playing U2 songs before classes? Yeah. Of course. I play all kinds of stuff during class. I, I play music not as entertainment or filler or because I have enough to say, but it's an essential part of doing what I do. And yeah, I'm, I'm still old school enough to play U2 songs. Yeah, love it. I, I love it, man. I remember yeah. it, and and just yeah, I'm I'm no musician by any stretch, but I always appreciated just making the other side of my yeah. brain work a little bit. So yeah. good well, stuff. I don't know if I told you this, Russell. What? Go ahead. I'm no musician either, but I can hit play. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Dr. Kreider, I, you you obviously remember this, but uh, my favorite course with you was actually the one. It was theology and culture, and man, our papers, like our assignments, were to listen to one of our favorite albums and, and write a paper about the theology in it. And I, that course was challenging. It was awesome just connecting theology with uh, artwork and music. And so just love how you think about that and challenge us in that. And so, um, yeah. That course morphed from uh, theology, what was it called? Issues in the Theological Method. It's now yes. Theology culture it's a three-hour course not a two-hour course and uh, it's yeah. being offered this this summer uh, for the Man. first time in a couple years so yeah i loved i loved interacting with theology and the arts yeah that's awesome and one of my th one of my favorite things about you yeah, i probably never told you this but the reason i like taking courses from you was because whenever i drive home at the end of the day i found myself wrestling with whatever we were talking about that uh, that day more than any other professor, just because you would you'd just ask these questions to get us thinking. You'd play devil's advocate a little bit just to get us thinking, and uh, you really wanted us to, to, to own it and, and, um, and, and wrap our minds around it, and I uh, found myself doing that. So thank you for always challenging your students like you do. So you call that a win. Uh, if you're walking yeah. away, arguing with me, or trying to find holes in my view, or coming up with an alternative view, I feel like I've done my job. I've got you thinking about really important questions. That's right. And probably yeah, well, some today is important, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it was it was great, great experience. And no, so, no. yeah, hopefully today we'll get some people thinking about dispensationalism and wrestling with some of these issues. So that's that's why we have you. So thank, thanks for being here. We are, we're preaching through the book of Ephesians. And as you get in chapter one, chapter two, and then specifically chapter three, we get into uh, this idea of a stewardship of God's grace, um, an economy of God's grace. Obviously in the tail end of chapter two, 11 through 22, we have um, this one who you, new humanity and the dividing wall has been broken down through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you have um, Jew and Gentile together. And so, you know, all kinds of questions come up in terms of what is this one new humanity and, and how does the church and Israel relate? Are those promises to Israel still there? And then um, then this stewardship of God's grace, what does it look like? And so all kinds of theological issues. And, and, and so I thought it, it would probably be helpful um, 
for us as, as DTS guys, as Faith Bible Church, we embrace dispensationalism. We embrace this idea of stewardship of God's grace um, in his story. And we just thought maybe it'd be helpful to, to have you define dispensationalism for us and um, why it's important when we think about continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah, that, those words you keep using, stewardship and administration, in earlier uh, translations, dispensation is the word that is that is used. Mm. That dispensationalism is a view that God deals with his people differently in different eras of redemption, and that uh, there are different responsibilities, there are different privileges and different opportunities, that in the outworking of God's plan of redemption, it occurs in successive stages. Uh, there is continuity in God's plan. It's the same God. Salvation is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We're all moving toward an earthly kingdom where all the effects of sin have been redeemed and all things are made new. But dispensationalists recognize that in the biblical story, there are relatively easily distinguishable periods in the history of the work of redemption. So what it, it, it matters for us because this is not a system that, that people have laid out a chart that people have developed and then imposed upon the scripture, but actually recognizing how in the biblical story, there, is, there are these changes in the way God deals with his people. God never changes but the way he deals with his people does. And Ephesians, particularly two and three, is a really central text for those questions related to the relationship between Israel and the church and how Israel and the church uh, separately and together fit into God's plan of redemption. Yeah. Go ahead. Well said. Yeah, I like it. As you, as you think through um, those different, those different stages of, of revelation of his grace and, uh, and maybe even um, sometimes we think about it in terms of what are the mechanics that he reveals himself or the, the, the and, and I guess what I'm asking is some, sometimes we, we name these periods, you know, um, innocence, conscience, law, and, and we've named them that, but I've also seen them named based on the, the character so, for example, uh, the patriarchs or the church, and so you you have them named based off of of the the primary principle through which that stewardship is given. Um, do you have a preference on that in terms of how those are laid out? You know, as you started to frame the question, I was thinking I really should have an answer to that question. I I don't. I don't really have a vested interest in the way those eras are named, nor does it really matter how many there are. Uh, ma many dispensationalists uh, identify seven because seven's a number of perfection and it, seven becomes a big deal. Uh, the Dallas Seminary doctrinal statement affirms three, uh, and it does that because there are three that the Bible explicitly calls dispensation. So when Paul mm -hmm. describes this in chapter three of Ephesians, this dispensation of grace that was given to him, uh, which is different from the dispensation prior to that. And then he, in chapter one, he refers to the dispensation of the fullness of time. So you have that word that's, that's being used for those three different stages, those three errors, er er errors. Uh, it, it seems to me that what is, significant what is important is that we recognize these changes and there are a variety of ways to to name them I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable when people use grace for one of them because it seems to that, that would seem to indicate that there was no grace until we get to the dispensation of grace but there's a great deal of grace in the mm -hmm. biblical story long before we get to the church. I mean, God's yeah. God's gracious to the rebels in the garden. He's gracious to Noah and his family. He's gracious to Abraham and his yeah. seed. But we do see God manifesting his grace, but he does manifest his grace differently. And what the the, the stewardship of, of his grace 
I, I think indicates a greater responsibility based upon a greater revelation of God's. I mean, Jesus says something about uh, faithfulness in little things brings greater things. That that there is this sense with more light comes more responsibility. And as we make our way through the biblical story, and we have more and more of the clarity of the narrative of redemption the more responsibility there is to respond to steward that grace well i like that phrase that yeah. you've been using yeah that's good when you um yeah when you when you think about the story of redemption um obviously god gets really specific in genesis 12 with abraham and um, we, we clearly see that God wants to be a blessing to him and his family, but also through him to the nations. And then in Ephesians, um, when you fast forward and we, we see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension, his promised return, and then somehow this, these two groups, the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, are now made one. Um, the question becomes is, do the promises that were made to Abraham and his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and then David later on with the um, the Davidic covenant, do those promises when they when they expand to include us Gentiles, does that mean that now they're fulfilled and are no longer uh, have specific inclusion to to Israel? There are a couple of things in there. Then I'll answer the specific question. There are a couple of things in there that are that are really important. When God chooses Abraham and he chooses to bless Abraham and his descendants, he the purpose of blessing Abraham is not for Abraham. It's to bless mm -hmm. all peoples on earth. Yeah. Uh, that God uh, later contextualizes the promises to Abraham in this nation, Israel, that he constitutes as a people through one of the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Uh, but the purpose of calling Israel was not merely to bless Israel. The purpose in calling Israel was to bless the nations. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests and to, to spread the knowledge of God to the nations. When we get to, uh, but so God's plan has always been bigger than Israel. His plan has always been to bless the nations, not just this one nation. Uh, but the question is, how will God accomplish that? Because when he makes that covenant with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, uh, this the means by which you worship God, the means by which you become part of his community— is by joining the community and joining the community requires for men that minor surgery um for women to be connected to a man uh, that you, you you it's not salvation by works it's that, that you live by this law so that god has always had gentiles who become part of the people of israel become part of the the people of god happens in the coming of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. This, Paul argues this is an incredible demonstration, not only of God's grace, but also of his wisdom, that what separated these two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, is destroyed in his flesh, that the dividing wall of hostility between the two which I take it is the law of Moses. It is the thing that is the boundary between Israel and uh, and the nations in Israel and Gentiles. That in his flesh, in his body, he destroys that dividing wall of hostility and he unites the two into one new man so that the promises God has made to Israel will be fulfilled to Israel. The, the plan of God now explicitly is expanded so that Gentiles in the church receive some of those same blessings. But dispensationalists have always argued, and we're not the only people who do this, but dispensationalists have always argued that there is a future for Israel. There is a future plan for Israel, that the promises that God made to Abraham, repeated to Isaac, repeated to Jacob, 
he repeated to the Israelites that there would be land forever. So when he says to Abraham, you and your seed will walk in this land forever. That cannot be fulfilled unless forever means forever. And I know the Hebrew scholars are going to say that Hebrew doesn't literally mean forever. It means a really long time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And the millennium, which is a thousand years, is not a really long time. It's a yeah. relatively short period of time in human history. So that the promises God made to Israel will be fulfilled to mm -hmm. Israel, to ethnic Israel. But I take it they also will be fulfilled to all those who are in Jesus. That the promises God made to Abraham are fulfilled, Paul says in Galatians, in his seed. He doesn't say into seeds. He says, and to a seed whose name is Christ. So the, the blessings mm -hmm. promised to Abraham and to Israel are fulfilled in Jesus. Jewish people who are related to, to God through faith in Christ receive the blessings. Gentiles who are related to God through faith in Christ receive the blessings too. Israel loses nothing. Israel shares those blessings along with, uh, with, with Gentiles, with the nations. It's interesting uh, that Paul himself, and I think it's in First Corinthians, says that God blesses the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there, there are the infinite number of blessings to go around. We get to share that. I have this vivid memory a number of years ago of a Messianic Jewish couple, both of whom had been taught as Jews. If you become a Christian, you lose all the blessings. Because the blessings to Israel are tied to Israel. And if you become a Christian, now you, you lose all the blessings. And I, I, I hope mm. I never forget that the day we were talking in eschatology about that. And, and with tears streaming down his face, Scott said, you mean I didn't lose anything? Mm. And you mean I get to share them with you? Like, oh, my yeah. goodness. He was so moved. And I wow. realized... That, that hasn't moved me in the way that it did him. But what I, what I think of that through his eyes, that he lost nothing when he became a Christian. Mm. Uh, we get to share in these blessings of God together. Yeah. Wow. That's a beautiful story. I love that. I mean, that's, that's, that's rich. Um, you know, Dr. Kreider, you know, as you're, you're talking about this, there are a lot of folks who would read Ephesians 2 and kind of interpret that to say, uh, God's God's done with Israel now. He's focused on the church, and you know, and and so there's some of the you, man. You just you in your answer listed out several promises to Israel that will be fulfilled. Uh, but a lot of folks will say, no, no, no. That's God's done with that. He's focused on the church. What are, what are some of the issues with that line of thinking? I'm uh, traditionally called re replacement theology. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about some of the problems inherent in that. Yeah, I think, the, and it's going to sound snarky perhaps, I think the most significant problem is the scripture. The scripture yeah. never, never provide, in, in my view, never provides support for that. It, mm -hmm. it rather, I mean, Paul addresses that question, I think explicitly in, in Romans 9 to 11, mm -hmm. that, that God has stopped working with Israel for a time doesn't mean that he, he has forsaken her. But he will return and uh, and deal with her again. The, the promises that are fulfilled in the book of Revelation, we have this, uh, it's, it's an Old Testament promise too, Zechariah 14, for example, that the nations come to Jerusalem and worship the king in Jerusalem. And in Revelation 22, we see Israel and the church and the nations together. That the when God makes promises, God is faithful to his promises. Dispensationalists often use language of literal here. Uh, that language is not really as helpful as it could be. But when I, I would say when God makes promises, he is faithful to fulfill those promises. Yeah. And to turn them into something other than, I mean, the, the land is the land. I mean, and as we read through Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament, the, the, the boundaries of the land are defined. That this is this is the land where Abraham and his seed will walk in that land forever. And the seed, again, that the seed is Jesus, so that all those who are in him will be 
will 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 live with uh, with Jesus forever. So I think I, I think the major problem with so-called replacement theology is that it fails to grasp and to wrestle with the the language in the biblical text. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, obviously, when you start talking about Israel uh, dispensationalism. Um, a lot of the things that we're talking about, the land, um, our, our minds and our hearts immediately turn to what's happening there currently. Mm. And um, well, uh, for me, when I, when, I hear, uh, when I hear what's happening and people immediately want to turn to prophecy and, and our eyes need to head to the, you know, our eyes need to be looking up and, and Christ and his imminent return, um, yeah, I just I'd love for you to to speak on that, and I mean, obviously our hearts are broken. I mean, it it, it is. It, I don't want to assume anything here. Our, our hearts are broken for for people on both sides who are losing life and who are being displaced and are held hostage in in a host of other atrocities that are happening there, and and that's the hard part about this conversation is I don't want to politicize it. I don't want to, you know, make it a theological debate. Um, there are real lives at stake. Um, and in that, for us to understand that, man, our eyes are turned to that spot right now, uh, what would your words be in, in light of all of the current events that are happening? Yeah, we have a long history in the dispensational tradition of reading the Bible and the newspaper together and, and saying, this fulfills this. The, to see the contemporary events as direct, explicit fulfillment of biblical prophecy. I think that that approach is dangerous and is wrongheaded because everybody who has seen this as that fulfilled has been proven to be wrong or mm. at least not completely accurate and uh, so we need to be really careful about that. We should always be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, uh, which is a reference not just to the city, but to the to the land. Uh, we should always be anticipating the return of the Jewish Messiah, who is our Savior. He's coming back to make everything new. Uh, and events like this ought to drive us to be more aware more um, uh, more hopeful about his return. But we also ought to be people who are grieving with those who grieve. And we are we should be people who are deeply saddened and pained by the loss of life. I mean, there 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 are always two sides in every conflict. And there are tragedies and horrors on both sides and try we should grieve deeply mm. the 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 murder of infants in their uh, cribs and their bodies being mm. baked in ovens so the, i mean the 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 linkage of that back to the holocaust is not coincidental that that's a mm. horrific thing to observe but we also ought to be concerned about bombs being dropped on government complexes and, and uh, what's going on there is so is so horrific and so hard to conceive and but it also is hard to conceive a, any relatively easy solution either and so we should grieve we should pray we should be active as we can be and yeah you're right it should not be politicized this this is where it's well beyond that there's a real sense in which i am um, at least as concerned about the anti the rise of anti-Semitism around the world and the kinds of horrific things people are saying about Jewish people. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that this is a really volatile time for us. Uh, but thankfully, we trust in a God who has not forgotten His people. We right. trust in God who will complete what He started. We trust in God who will make all things new it, it is um 
it's a whole lot easier to attack Jews today because they are the great majority of them are together in one nation. I mean, they, when I was in, in 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 seminary, they used to say there are more Jews in New York City than there are in the land of Israel. That that that's no longer anywhere close to true. Right. There are there are more Jews and more Jewish people in Israel than were killed in the Holocaust, uh, and that. That makes them targets in a way that they weren't before. I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping this is something that comes to an end soon, and things return to some sense of normal. But my Israeli friends, particularly Jewish Israeli friends, they've been living in in a volatile situation for years. It's a whole lot yeah. worse in the short term now. But yeah, I think we should grieve with those who grieve. And we should, it's hard to rejoice with those who rejoice in the midst of such horrific evil uh, that humans are capable of inflicting on other human beings. We desperately need the Prince of Peace to bring peace. That's right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Going back to your, your words earlier, I mean, we're thankful that God's faithful to his promises and he's got a plan and um, say, amen, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I mean, yeah. yeah. Oftentimes when we think about dispensationalism, Israel, millennial kingdom, the return of Christ, tribulation, all of that language, um, one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Bach, had, had kind of summed it up. Something I heard him say one time is, is eschatology is not God's justice, but it's the establishment of righteousness, his righteousness in an evil world. And I, I thought that was so well said. And And sometimes it's easy to to think about Armageddon or, you know, justice coming and people uh, punished. But, man, God is going to establish his righteousness in the middle of all this evil and chaos, and we're going to get a glimpse of it in a millennial kingdom. But then there's this eternal state that is going to be the absolute perfect yeah. establishment of righteousness. What, what would you add to that? In a similar way that people were shocked, surprised, um, unaware of how God would bring peace between Jews and Gentiles, so that in the church, Jews as Jews, Gentiles as Gentiles are united in one new man. It's an amazing uh, act of God to achieve peace by offering the sacrifice of his son. I mean, he didn't do it through military conquests. He didn't do it through great signs and wonders. He didn't do it through a display of his power. He, he did it through an act of sacrifice and an act of condescension. Wouldn't it be just like God to, at the end of time, establish this kingdom of this eternal kingdom of righteousness, peace, and prosperity through a similar act of grace, a similar act of condescension, a similar act of sacrifice to which we would say and you might say i cannot conceive how that could happen well let me tell you nobody could conceive that he would unite <laughs> jews and gentiles together in the yeah. in the person son the, the yeah. god who is claims to be gracious and merciful and compassionate and slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness mm -hmm. and i think you can trust a good god to do what is good and in a real sense that mm -hmm. question is has excited me because it, uh, I, uh, as I think about how God might completely upend, overturn our expectations, that this co coming conquering king with an army from heaven destroys all of his enemies. Maybe he has a better plan than that mm -hmm. because this sure looks like a strange way to save the world. I think I read that <laughs> somewhere. Um, and, and maybe in a similar way, we will be shocked and surprised by the way he does what he does uh, in in the end. So yeah, he the our hope is in a risen savior where our hope is in a savior who promised he's coming back to make everything new. I mean that's that's kind of the last words he said. Behold, yeah. I am making everything new. And he is he has started that work. He he accomplishes that work through us, but ultimately he will bring to pass uh, everything that he has promised to do. And that, that's in the midst of all kinds of things to be afraid of, to be uncertain about. I think people desperately need hope and the, the hope of Christ's return to make things new is a 
it, it, it's a it's a I think somebody calls it a precious hope. Uh, I think it it uh, it is that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, Jamie, I know you had had a, for folks that said, hey, I'd like to read more about this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, Dr. Kreider, you, you obviously know this, but you and Dr. Bingham are general editors. I've got it digitally, but Dispensationalism and the History of Redemption. I don't know if you want to talk about your part in, in that book at all, but I think that could be a, a, a helpful resource for folks tuning in. So any, anything you want to share about that? Yeah, I'm really um, excited about, proud of that work in the, uh, hopefully the appropriate sense of that word. Yeah, yeah. what my colleague um, and I did in that work was, it was, was, was kind of an update of what Dr. Ryrie did back in the 1960s in his dispensationalism today. And we were thrilled that the same publisher of Ryrie's work was interested in ours. Uh, instead of sitting and writing a book, uh, either one of us or together, we thought it'd be much stronger if we could gather together a number of dispensational voices. Some have criticized the, the book because everybody's connected to Dallas Seminary. That actually was our goal. <laughs> That uh, since Dallas Seminary is a dispensational school, when people think of dispensationalism, they think of DTS. Yeah, so it'll be helpful to have people from a, uh, across the spectrum of dispensational views and and in a great um, span of ages. Uh, so um, yeah, so we put that thing together. What what uh, what my chapter does is. Provide, try to argue what dispensationalism is and what it's not. There's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of straw man, a lot of criticism of dispensationalism that simply are no longer the case. They might have been at one time, but they no longer are. So I wanted to define the, the term and uh, defend who we are. And then after a chapter um, on history, the, Dr. Spiegel's chapter on history, uh, I think is a, an amazing it's unlike anything I'd ever read on the history of dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. It's really, really nicely done. Chapter on hermeneutics. Then we walk through the 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 biblical story uh, and show how dispensationalism uh, unpacks and reads this uh, this story. I, I yeah, I think the I think that book is a um, um, it's the best on the subject. I don't think anything that's come out <laughs> after it. Uh, measures up to it. There have been a lot of books written on dispensationalism, and particularly in the last year, there have been several that were not really positive toward the tradition, uh, including sure, yeah. the and fall of dispensationalism, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which, I mean, I told the author of that book, that's clickbait, uh, because <laughs> you, that's, that's really not what that that uh, book is arguing, but right. or you, you can yeah. cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Actually, it's a good. You know, you you bring that up, but what what are some of the what are some of the criticisms or maybe maybe say misperceptions about dispensational theology that you've heard out there? I mean, obviously you you're dealing with it in in this book and probably deal with questions all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in no particular order, people accuse dispensationalism of having a man made system that mm -hmm. then is is superimposed upon the Bible. And it and what in yeah. fact, I'm gonna try to demonstrate is it's exactly the opposite, that we're using the term dispensation because the Bible does. And we mm. use it, as Dr. Ryrie said, uh, we use it the same way, the, what he said, the, the biblical writers use it the same way we do, which is mm. sense of humor, it's the other way around. Um, it's, so it's not imposed upon, it's a biblical word and it seems to demonstrate it seems to be demonstrated by the way the, the Bible unfolds. It's a way of reading the scripture. Earlier dispensationalists had a uh, an anthropological dualism. They had an earthly people and a heavenly people. Uh, that's pretty well gone today. So that mm -hmm. uh, that's completely gone today. So that's still around. Uh, there have been people who accuse us of having multiple ways of salvation, uh, mm -hmm. that Jews were saved by obedience to the law, and now we're saved by grace through faith. I mean, those are the kinds, of, those are the major criticisms. Sure. And I guess I would also, uh, back to the rise and fall, 
uh, dispensationalism, because it has in the 20th century, had some major proponents who were focused on eschatology and biblical prophecy. Many people think dispensationalism is largely or nothing but a view of the tribula uh, the rapture tribulation mm. uh second coming the millennium uh and and dispensationalism does have a not a unique but a distinctive eschatology we are premillennial we believe Christ returns prior to the millennium because the Bible, in the Bible, chapter 19 of Revelation comes before 20. Christ returned in 19 to the 20th. It sounds looks pretty simple to me. Um, but there's a whole lot more to dispensationalism than distinctive eschatological positions. So I, don't, I, I, I love teaching eschatology um, because the students often come into that course expecting the first day to talk about the rapture and then the tribulation. Uh, we eventually talk about the rapture, but it's really late in the course because in my view you really can't understand the biblical story if you unless you start at the beginning of that story it's like walking into a movie theater when the movie is three quarters over you 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 don't know the characters you don't know the plot line and uh that, that really we need to understand the story that god has written and the story that God is writing. And so many of those themes of God's plan to bless the nations, for example, in Genesis 12 are very early in the story. The resurrection of the dead, chapter 13 of Genesis. I mean, there's no way Abraham can walk in that land unless he's been resurrected. So, I mean, those those things, are, I mean, I went a little bit far afield from your question, but those oh, are the that's just, things. That's great. I mean, I, I love that. I mean, it just... Uh, it's one of the things I, I love when I disi disciple guys sometimes is just taking them through that story and mm -hmm. watching history unfold and where God's moving and it man it just it makes the Bible so rich and um, when you just when when you just see how it all unfolds mm -hmm. like that it is yeah so watching the whole movie yeah, yeah. it's the greatest story ever told yeah yeah so so I guess it'd be inappropriate to ask for a a prediction on when Christ is going to return. I mean, would that be a little, I mean, considering we're DTS and dispensationalist. We need a time and a date, Dr. Kreider. So. <laughs> we need clickbait. <laughs> you know, it's been a little while since this has, since it has happened, but I regularly uh, over the last 20 some years have gotten an email or a phone call from somebody who wants a half hour of my time because he's figured out uh, the time I usually give them more than a half hour because I know it's going to take longer than that. And they go through <laughs> their full argument and all their ma mathematical calculations, and wow. they and and this has happened multiple times. So what do you think? And I say you lost me. They said where? I said you lost me back at the beginning because Jesus <laughs> said nobody knows the day or the hour or the time. It'll be at a time you don't expect it. It'll be like the days of Noah. Like like, like no no nobody knows. Uh, we all wake up every morning, happy to have woken up again, and we every morning, whether we do it intentionally or deliberately or not, we we are living in the hope of Christ's return to make everything new, and it will it'll happen. Um, I'm hoping it happens in my lifetime. I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. If I do. Uh, death is not the end because the resurrected Christ promises to make everything new, which includes raising our bodies from the dead. So, yeah, uh, it's not inappropriate. It's not inappropriate to ask, but uh, I my strong exhortation to anybody who is listening: uh, run from people who claim to know. They claim to know <laughs> yeah. something that God doesn't know, that Jesus doesn't know, and you know, eventually somebody might get it right. Yeah, but there's yeah. no extra credit for having picked the right day. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, we don't uh, we don't know the when, but we know the what, and we yeah. we can see how God is going to do that, and that's yeah. a beautiful thing. And so, yeah, yeah just encourage anybody who's watching uh, if if you want a deeper understanding of this. Once again, just want to recommend recommend Dr. Kreider's book, uh, Dispensationalism and the History of Redemption. Check it out if you want to have a better grasp on this. But yeah. Dr. Kreider, thanks a ton for taking some time. I know our people will find this helpful, other yeah. folks watching as well. So 
thank you for, for what you're doing. Keep it up, and uh, yeah. maybe we can do this again sometime. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You know, it's uh, my pleasure. I love talking about the things that are really important, and there's very little more important than understanding the biblical story of redemption. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dr. Cryer. I appreciate you joining us. Yeah. Very good.